Let me tell you, writing videos about games that I don't like is a blast. Getting to write hyperbole and make it seem like anyone with the priority straight should have to worry about Chicken Little on PS2 is great fun. But playing all those games really helps you remember how much you love the games you really do. And I'll tell you guys, this is a game I really, really love. I mean no exaggeration when I say this game is easily in my top 10 favorites of all time. And without further ado, it's time to let her rip. Now, I could go over the history of this game's development, which was a rocky one. I mean, this was the first console Metal Gear game following Metal Gear Solid 4, with Kojima working on the PSP game Peace Walker and the Metal Gear Solid HD collection, meaning that Kojima Productions at large had the ability to make whatever game they wanted as per Kojima's instructions, which led to a Raiden-focused game to bridge the gap of its transformation in Metal Gear Solid 4, which had development issues given the amount of freedom they had, leading to not having a clear and focused vision on what the game should be, eventually leading them to bring in Platinum Games and focusing on their niche of high-octane character action games with amazing Amazing scores, killer combos, and memorable characters. Oh crap, that's just the development history of Metal Gear Rising. Well, what I really want to focus on is our main character, Raiden. So Raiden is the most controversial character in Metal Gear. From a story standpoint, he's an odd facet. From a thematic standpoint, he's a phenomenal character. And from a fan perspective, he is the White Devil. Metal Gear Solid 2 is one of the biggest leaps forward for a series ever. Comparing Metal Gear Solid 1 to 2 is like comparing a cave painting to the Mona Lisa. Both have their merits, but it's just so much further ahead. People were foaming at the mouth to see where their complex interwoven story of Metal Gear went next, and they wanted more of their breakout star, Solid Snake. He was really the glue that held Metal Gear Solid together. The eternally confused, gruff-voiced super spy was instantly bumping elbows with Lara Croft and... Gex, as an iconic character of the fifth generation of consoles. And with Metal Gear Solid 2 coming out so soon, people wanted more! And when they got it, it seemed like everything was peachy. This time, Snake's taken down a ship in the Hudson River, overrun with Russians to steal a new Metal Gear, said to be a Metal Gear Rex killer. A quick revolver ocelot betrayal later, and Snake is presumed dead, and held responsible for the whole incident. Oh boy, oh boy, it looks like we're gonna be playing as an even edgier Snake! A man on the run from international law, hooking back up with Roy Campbell to save an oil rig that's been taken hostage by the Sons of Liberty- Who the f*** is this twink? Yes, this is Snake, or at least that's his code name. His real fake name is Raiden. He's a whiny, pretty boy with relationship issues and stupid hair. To say people were upset would be an understatement. People were furious that the absolute pinnacle of machismo, Mr. Backflip of a rocket, Solid Snake himself, was now some dickhead named Jack. However, in the context of the themes of Metal Gear Solid 2, it made perfect sense. The balls on Kojima's part to make a game all about lies told by people and the government, and then have the main character of the game be a lie in all the marketing is stunning. And it's not like Raiden's a bad character by any means, it's just not what anyone wanted. This led to a massive backlash, which was then mocked in Metal Gear Solid 3, the best one. They made Raikov a high-ranking Russian official in the game that you need to beat up and steal the clothes off of, with there even being specific dialogue for whether or not you kill him, as a way for Kojima to see how much people really hated Raiden. Message came back loud and clear, and it was a resounding bullet put in the back of Raikov's head. Kojima took this as a challenge and decided to bring back the most hated character with one goal, make him so cool that people couldn't possibly hate him anymore. In the hands of a lesser creator, this would have failed miserably. In Kojima's... I am lightning. The rain transformed. lore reason for Raiden becoming a breakdancing Terminator is that he was captured by the Patriots and experimented on and had most of his body replaced with cybernetics to make him into a cyborg, uh, but the much more interesting out of lore reason was that Grey Fox was really cool, but he's dead, but Olga was really cool, and she's dead. Raiden isn't dead, but he's not really cool. Making him a cyborg ninja fixed that, and now he's awesome. Metal Gear Solid 4 is already sillier than your average Metal Gear game, which is saying a lot, so Raiden suddenly showing up and being 10 times cooler than he should be was honestly to be expected. 
Opinions were slowly turning on Raiden, but he still wasn't universally beloved, and that wasn't gonna stand. The gap in time between Metal Gear Solid 2 and 4 was ripe to plug up with a game, and that was the plan. And if you want to hear about Rising's development cycle, please rewind to the beginning of the video and listen for real this time. Don't be on your phone! So before getting into the game, I have to get into the game. This crunchy outer shell won't keep me out much longer, Raiden! I got the game for Christmas in 2013, so it still has most of the original promo paper that came with it. Join the Konami loyalty program. What a silly couple words to put together. Why would they do that? This box art is good and all, highlights the most important part of the game, cutting. Although I think the image on the back would have worked better. Probably, at least. There's a lot of online information for this game with no online features. Before it came out, people thought the box art was gonna look like this. So the game starts with Raiden's new life as a bodyguard working for Maverick, a really evil sounding private military company that's currently escorting an African prime minister, don't ask what his name is, you're not gonna get to know him for much longer, until the convoy is attacked by the living proof that Brazilians know how to double jump and aren't sharing it with us, Jetstream Sam. He not safe for works this guy into chunks before turning his pearly whites towards us. We escape, but Raiden stays back to hold off the assassins. Here we sort of get introduced to the game's combat. It's not too different now as opposed to later, but the key difference is in blade mode. Other than that, we got all the tools we'll be working with for the rest of the game. We got a light and heavy swing, ninja run, and a jump. You can string together heavy and light attacks to build up a combo and deal more damage. The swordplay in this game is fantastic. You smoothly slide from enemy to enemy, cutting them up as you get accustomed to the controls. You can deflect bullets with a ninja run, slide into people to launch them. Before anything else, this game makes you feel invincible and like a total Long Dong Johnson. That Long Dong Johnson-ness gets put to the ultimate test as Raiden's one true rival reappears for round... Jesus, five? Metal Gear Ray, outfitted with new weapons by the even eviler sounding PMC, Desperado. We also get introduced to Desperado's leader, Dr. Eggman himself, Sundowner. He manages to kidnap the Prime Minister and lets us know his plan to spark a new international incident in order to jumpstart the economy out of the funk it fell into after Metal Gear Solid 4. He escapes and sicks the Metal Gear on us and we get possibly the best first boss in a video game. I mean it when I say this game is banging on all cylinders from the starting gate. Metal Gear Ray can do a lot of things. He can charge, fire bullets, stomp, and blast you with his plasma cannon. Here's where the game shows you one of its more clever aspects. Every boss is designed to teach you a lesson. Instead of other games that teach you what you learned just previously to make sure you were paying attention, Rising manages to put your basic skills to the test each and every time. This time it quizzes you on if you've learned the game's most vital command, the parry. Dodging is for Google Gaga babies who can't change their own diapers like I do. Real men stand their ground, hold up their swords, and hit them instead. Pairing is done by holding the joystick in the direction of an oncoming attack and pressing the light attack. Time it just right and you can react with a super strong attack. Here you can parry the stomps and charge attack to weaken its legs and head or take out those pesky turrets. Even though you're just an ant to this thing, you feel almighty as you take it apart bit by bit before it swings a sword arm at you and you- Rules of nature! Did I mention the soundtrack? Gotta admit, it's a pretty frugal business move on Konami's part to make this fantastic album and then build an awesome hack and slash game around it. The music in this game is phenomenal, and I'll go over each boss track as we get to them. As for Rules of Nature, it says a lot about this soundtrack that this is one of the most iconic songs from it, and it might be the weakest. Obviously the Rules of Nature is great, but the rest of the song is just a little lacking in all honesty. Kind of quiet, no real impressive instrumental parts, but it's still like an 8 out of 10, but when you grade it on a bell curve with the rest of Rising, well, someone's got to keep the back of the class warm, right? Back to the battle. Ryan sets the tone for the rest of the game as he picks up and tosses the Metal Gear before running up the arm he just threw and slicing it in half. This alone would have been a great opening, but after chasing down Sundowner, he leaps back to life and back into the fight. But this stage is a little less cool since you're on equal footing, but using your blade mode to cut up these missiles as they fly at you is really cool. After running along the missiles, because of course you can do that, Ryan gets launched and has to come back down to finish the fight where we fuck, 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 fuck. first try. Got a little sidetracked there and forgot we kind of have a prime minister to save. Sundowner shows that only bad guys smile and escapes on a train, though Raiden is close behind. Before we get a chance though, the prime minister is killed and we have to fight Sam while Sundowner flees. If the Ray fight was meant to show you how amazing Raiden is, the Jetstream Sam fight is meant to show you just how out of his depth Raiden is. You can't land a hit on Sam. He counters you, shrugs off your hits, treats you like you're a novice, cause you are. You just picked up the controller and killed a remote control toy. Good job, buddy. Here's a swordsman, and he's better than you. 
He's so much better than you, he manages to cut off your arm and slice out your eye! This also reinforces how this game does a fantastic job knowing just how silly everything is. Shit, not again! After that, you get to stew in the fact that Sam is you, but better. You can swing your sword, but if you couldn't beat him with two arms, what chance do you have with one? He's about to finish you off before Maverick Head Boris comes in to save you. Get to waiting, huh? Ah, he said the line! So the tutorial to the game ends with Raiden and the player left battered and beaten. Two minutes later, we meet up with Raiden and his body's been upgraded. This new body is prepared for everything Desperado has planned since they've recently started working with a vicious revolutionary army. Raiden is sent out to put a stop to it and- Oh, he's just so cool! So anyone that knows me knows that I can't get enough of edgy characters. They're my bread and butter. I love every one of them, and this is no exception. Ryan's new body is such a stark contrast from the old one, which went for more of a realistic, not too out of place on the battlefield design. <laughs> He'll have spikes on his shoulders, studded stiletto heels, we'll give him a barcode on his forehead, a big dumb eye patch, and a jaw guard, which is the only design that actually has both form and function, apparently. We then get into a fight with a group of mercs and see the game's selling point. Blade time. At the cost of this bar under your health, you can slow down time and precisely cut anyone and anything. Anyone and anything. This feels amazing, and even today with tech constantly advancing, feels like a feature that no other game has replicated just right. Getting to hack away at people and make them into unipods never stops being fun and satisfying. And if you cut somebody just right, you get to rip out their spines and drink the sweet electrolytes that come from them. The enemies are just vending machines with health inside them that you can cut through mid-combo if things get dicey to stay in the fight. Because of that, fights can feel really frenetic and full of danger without ever feeling overwhelming since you're never truly out of options. We also get introduced to the Geckos. They're much tankier and faster than the regular grunts, but just like an MGS4, they're a little more than fodder in Raiden's way. It's here we see one of the game's... less fun parts? Stealth. It's a Metal Gear game, so stealth is gonna be in its marrow, regardless of whether or not it should be there. The game doesn't prioritize stealth by any means. You're supposed to run through and dice up your opponents into hamburger, but there are segments where they awkwardly shuffle up and say, I'd really appreciate if you got in the box. And I like going in the box, but not in a game as fast as this. After saving civilians and fighting through more geckos, we lock horns with our first boss, LQ84I, or Blade Wolf. It's the game's first regular boss. Bosses from here on out are gonna be a lot more like Blade Wolf than Metal Gear Ray. Before the fight, we get to chat with Blade Wolf. He says he can question his directives, but he can't stray from them. And Raiden asks, What's the meaning of life? Why are we here? I am here to kill you. Blade Wolf is super acrobatic. He'll flip all around the arena, launch himself at you, gore you with the chainsaw on the back, because yeah, stealth ops, chainsaw. After you take him down a bit, he'll call in reinforcements to deal with you, but that just further solidifies their status as walking health packs. After a few more rounds of that, you hack him into pieces and the fight's over. Another fight with a helicopter, where the game not so subtly implies you should give sub-weapons a try later, and there's more sneaking and more slashing. You meet the heavy grunts at this point, that you have to soften up a bit before you cut them. Once we've run through a wrecked building, we spy on the head of the revolutionaries, Dulceyev, talking to some woman. Raiden gets scared after hearing he can get cooties from over 500 yards away, and she leaves. Once we make it closer and sneak through a factory, we make it to the top of the refinery and square up to Mistral. She's a member of the Winds of Destruction, a group within Desperado whose whole purpose is to look really cool and have weird powers, because I don't see how they're gonna help with the day-to-day -day runnings of a company. Her ability is to take the arms of dwarf geckos for herself to make new arms and a bow staff. This boss fight is another one that teaches you a few lessons. When you manage to destroy your staff, Mistral retreats to get more arms to make a new one. When a gecko doesn't have any arms, it just becomes a high-speed deadly soccer ball for her to smack at you. This makes sure your parrying is fast enough to keep up with what's coming. What's worse is that the geckos left behind are still gonna try to attack you, and if they jump on you, you'll be stunned and unable to move. A quick shake a shake a shake and they'll be off, but it leaves you a sitting duck. The second phase has you fighting in a 2D plane with Mistral dashing all around the place. This one is a little too cramped and can leave you getting hit from a direction you aren't looking. The final phase, though, is pretty open, and now's the time to talk about her theme, Stranger I Remain. This is easily one of the best songs in the whole game. The instruments sound fantastic, the vocals are so well done, and the actual lyrics show one of Rising's best little additions. Since they're all lyrical tracks, you actually have to have something to say, so all the boss themes use their lyrics to explain their motivations. 
From Astral, it's all about how she feels out of place anywhere but on the battlefield. It's the one place she's at home. The lyric internal temperature rising is especially ironic when you end the fight by turning her into a nice statue and chipping her away. Your night's forecast. A freeze is coming. Dolsayev takes the news well. Now, you may be asking, what does this have to do with the wider story of Metal Gear Rising other than knocking off a member of Desperado? So we're in Mexico now, don't ask, and Ryan's investigating claims that there's human trafficking going on down in the sewers. However, Ryan being a hulking murder golem might tip off a few people, so he gets a disguise to blend in. Relax, Kev. I'll blend right in. Yeah. Like a chameleon, Raiden. Also, we have a patched up Blade Wolf as our new Scooby-Doo sidekick. Why did we do that? Be honest, it's just nice to have company that doesn't bore us. So we go down to the yucky sewers to find out where they're holding all the people they're trafficking. Blade Wolf scouts ahead and we're left to fight a new enemy type. These big gorilla guys are tough, have a lot of unparryable attacks, ranged attacks, and can leap away and ruin your lock-on. Later on, then, you have to fight them in packs. If the standard grunt was too easy for you, don't worry, they have you covered. I should also mention the upgrades. Between missions, you get the chance to enhance Raiden's body to hit harder, take more hits, gain energy, and learn new sword techniques. Two, I made sure to get quickly where the launcher to do juggle combos and the defensive offensive, which is technically not a dodge, it's legally distinct. You attack too, I'm not a diaper baby, I swear. After cutting through the sewers, we meet up with this young man waxing vanilla sophical and have to save him from these raptor UGs with this nasty EMP blast that can stun you. Once you turn them into the chunks they were always meant to be, we go back to ask the boy what he's doing there and- Oh, that's at least a 30 year old man trying to sound 10. I can't speak on the authenticity of his Guyanese accent, but I will say it's embarrassing to have people subtitle you. So he lets us know that whoever's doing this is taking homeless kids and gutting their organs. For what, we don't know, but there's like two reasons gutting kid organs will ever be acceptable and this isn't one of them. We hoof it deeper into the sewers before realizing the lab is the sewers and sneak deeper in. There we get to see... You think this place is OSHA compliant? So that's a lot of children brains, so we link up with a dwarf gecko to get in deeper and open a door. I can tell that they want me to take out the guards as the gecko and just walk through as Raiden, but... My finger slipped. The boss for this level is a Grod Mech. He's the heaviest and toughest of the mini-bosses and is gonna show up pretty frequently as a regular enemy from now on. He's not too tough, but you have to watch out for the missiles since ninja running can't deflect those. In the next room, we find out where they're holding on the kids, but the cell they're in is filling up with chloroform, and that's gonna kill him if we don't get inside. But the doctor behind the scooping has George and is holding him hostage. We can't let delightful little George be hurt, so we slice through his arm to cut the doctor down. Now the next step should be to stroll into World Marshal, the people working with Desperado, and get all the baby brains back, right? Well, not so fast, cowboy. Through legal loopholes and smudging, there isn't a crime happening here. Sundowner, Desperado, and World Marshal are managing to steal children's organs in the sewers of Mexico and are doing it legally. Not to mention the fact that World Marshal privatized the police force in America, so we can't tell them about it. That's like telling World Marshal what World Marshal is doing. So Raiden gets his Ted Kaczynski fan shirt on and does a little domestic terrorism on World Marshal. He formally resigns from Maverick as to not drag them down with him, but he's not gonna let children have their brains taken away. Fair enough, cause. So the next mission starts in the streets of Denver, Colorado, where World Marshal is. The enemies switch over from Desperado goons to Denver's finest. Luckily, my sword doesn't discriminate, and they're all made the same bloody mess by the end. The game's back in its power fantasy mode, since now we're fighting two of the last boss at once and handling it fairly well. Horace tells us that officially we're through, but we'll still be working together over private comms. Turns out gutting kids is enough to make anyone's tummy turn. If there's a single guy behind this door when it opens, they're gonna be history. Fuck. We have to partake in a little platforming to make sure we don't plummet to the city below. Let me try that again. We get introduced to the Hammer Goon now. These guys love their unparryable attacks, and just like the gorillas, are tanky. There are also these bird robots, which are a pain. Even with the lock on, you don't really get to attack them with any comfort. They're fast, aren't easy to hit with rocket launchers, and attack with pea shooters that technically ruin your combo. After rooftop running, we crash down in an elevator shaft to have to navigate a pitch dark underground tunnel. Okay, I think now is as good a time as any to put this up. Let me just, um... Yeah, okay, the game is currently in its sunshine phase. What's a sunshine phase? Well, Super Mario Sunshine is a fun game, right? Trust me, there's a point here. There are tons of parts of sunshine that when you're replaying it, you think, oh, I don't have to replay that level again, do I? The answer is always yes. Watermelon, lily pad, pachinko, volcano. It's still a good game, but there are parts that you'd rather rip a tooth out than play again. That's a sunshine part. 
Good games have sunshine parts. Your favorite game probably has a really bad sunshine part to it, and this is Rising's. I'll take it down when the game starts to be good again. This pitch dark segment is annoying since this is when the game puts your nose in it that Metal Gear is about stealth. You try and sneak around, but you can't see anything. You can only see with your AR visor, but you can't sneak and use your AR visor at the same time, so you're just sort of flying by the seat of your pants to go undetected. Except every time, without fail, you're gonna get spotted. Games are at their most frustrating when it feels like you don't actually have control over what you're doing, and this is that. But whatever, you get out and the Brazilian beast Sam is back. It's gotta be on like a sound stage or something. They keyed him out really well. He talks about how you're actually a real stinker for killing people. Ryan thinks he's a superhero when he's just a crazed murderer like the rest of them. He tells Ryan to really listen to the people he's fighting and then he starts listening to their thoughts, which is a thing he can do. It turns out we found Denver's two most tragic cops and Ryan starts to wonder if it's right to kill people who didn't have a choice. I mean, you can still juggle them after this, but Ryan's getting a little groggy and can't swing his sword good afterwards. Because of that, we just sort of uselessly amble to the next fight. The next fight is, with our next wind of destruction, Monsoon! And he... he has got a lot to say! Let's just get this part out of the way right now. Now there's a pretty meme. Exquisite. That's good, but then there's the rest of his speech. He tells Ryan he's a jerk, and then asks who's gonna save the week from the guy who saves the week. Raiden rightly retorts that they're the one putting vulnerable people in the position to fight Raiden in the first place. They're taking people in bad situations and putting them in worse ones. Monsoon's response is basically, Sucks to suck, brah. His outlook on life is extremely nihilistic. There's no humanity in being human. Just memes spread from one person to another. While he has a point that Raiden is using his noble goals as justification for killing, any kind of moralizing is dinged ever so slightly by the fact that there is a giant vault of baby brains directly behind him. Their plan is cartoonishly evil. All that's left is tying Ryan's wife to railroad tracks. And yet now they're talking down to you, trying to get you to see from the side of the baby brain scoopers. On the one hand, yeah, he's got a point, but on the other hand, don't be a dick about it. Even Sam can't stand this guy. The scene does pick up when Raiden finally admits that Monsoon has a point, and he delivers maybe the dumbest and best line in the game. Takes the scene that's supposed to be the serious one, and turns it into maybe the goofiest. What are you saying? I'm saying Jack is back. <laughs> Now you're just being nasty. <laughs> I don't really understand why Monsoon seems so disturbed by Ryan doing everything he just described. We were literally just talking about this. He cuts through the guards like hot butter and squares up for the main fight with Monsoon and oh, I want to like it more than I do, but I think this is the worst fight in the game. So Monsoon's gimmick is that he can split up into chunks like Buggy from One Piece. How can you cut the man who can't be cut? Waiting. The worst part of Metal Gear Rising is when you're not cutting stuff up and Monsoon either makes you wait out the periods where he can't be hit or use an EMP grenade. Problem there is that despite the fact that he's as thin as a piece of spaghetti, Monsoon has crazy durability. He tanks so much damage despite how I focused on upgrading my attack string through the whole game. I like Monsoon as an idea, but I just like it a lot more when he doesn't say or do anything. He's a great figurine. It's not all bad though, since he does still teach you like the other fights did. Instead of being a lesson though, this is a test. Consider this fight the graduation for parrying. If you can't parry Monsoon when he attacks you in the mist, you're never gonna beat the game. This segment is one of the most iconic in the whole game for a reason. The pace is pulse pounding and keeps you on your toes whenever he shows up again. This is of course helped by his song, Stains of Time. It's an absolute bop of a track. If you aren't into dubstep and electro noise, skip it. But it's got such a drop when Monsoon activates his second form. The lyrics too, all about how the peaceful rain that's meant to wash away anger and hatred isn't working until it leaves Monsoon in his suffering. It reflects how Monsoon is a survivor of the Cambodian genocide. Oh, how did I know that? Well, you gotta go to the codec, obviously. This is another bad part of the game. A lot of the story behind the bosses, and the game in general, is hidden behind codec calls. Obviously, they can't have the bosses tell you all this without sounding weird, and they can't interrupt the gameplay with hour-long cutscenes like MGS4, but still, you have to go out of your way to talk to Kevin to learn anything. Ryan's whole gaggle of mouth breathers, Sans, Doctor, and Wolf, are just really boring, and I never want to hear anything they have to say, like anything on the codec. It's a shame since these bosses do have characters and stories, but they make it way too hard to learn any of it. Luckily, after we see the true power of magnetism, we hack up Monsoon and enter World Marshal HQ. You want to know why I think this whole segment of the story is bad? You want to know how this whole story arc of Raiden battling with his inner turmoil over killing ends? 
He just doesn't care. Yeah, next scene, we're back to hacking guys up into ribbons. You're totally cool with it. So what was the point of bringing it up in the first place? Obviously, this game doesn't value its story like other Metal Gear Solid games, but still, it feels more like the game made up a reason for Raiden to have a problem rather than it happening naturally. So we strut into World Marshal HQ after realizing everyone else was wrong and our sombrero was actually really cool. We give the lady working the desk the standard American greeting and go check out Ripper Mode. Turns out Monsoon did teach Ryan a little something, and that's if he swings his sword a little harder, people crumple like sandcastles. Ripper Mode is your devil trigger. Raiden gets really strong, cleaves through normal enemies like they're nothing, and I won't lie, it feels fantastic to use, especially for crowd control. Unfortunately, it chews through your Zandatsu bar like crazy and can still be knocked around by RPGs. This level really made me hate fighting these things because they only ever come from out of your view and ruin combos. Fight like a man! So we try to ride up in the elevator, but we can't because it's embarrassed and can't perform when the front door is open, so we go back and figure out that this game came out in 2013, and for tax purposes, they put a turret section in. This lasts for maybe a minute before we just go back and get in the elevator anyway. This elevator isn't elevating enough though, so we gotta get on a different one, a freight elevator. One that can hold the 10 billion baby brains they're keeping upstairs. I actually do manage to stealth my way through this next part and even do it in style before it all comes tumbling down. After that, they attempt to make you play the video game Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, but I know better and Ninja run the hell out of Dodge. See, now why couldn't we just have a debate about this? We get back inside the building and enter a Japanese garden. This is literally only here because one of the heads of World Marshal is a big weeb and wants to look at Japanese stuff. Being the culture vulture we are, we soak this place up like a sponge. There's a secret hidden at the top of the pagoda and I always make a point to get it when I play through this. Fuck Japan, I hate it here. So we make it to the elevator finally, get sent wave after wave of baddies to hack up while we wait to reach the outer atmosphere. The wait time is anything to go by. How tall is this building? Just when you get ready to jump off to safety, some dwarf geckos try to slow us down before we can jump out of here. Nice try. So Sundowner's right behind this door and we're about to beat him up, but you look different, Sundowner. Before we throw down with the big bald baddie, we gotta get through Mistral's spare body. This doesn't take as long as the last one, but at the same time, if you could please just make me mash the button when I'm stunned, this is a hack and slash game, not Mario Party. So we scrap Mistral and move on. 36 minutes on the second after fighting Monsoon, we have a rematch. He just needed a nap and some juice, good as new. He's still doing monsoon things, but he can't talk anymore, so this boss fight is better than the original. This does serve as a really nice way to show you how far you've come. These two gave you so much trouble before, and now you're slicing through them like they're nothing. We finally made it to the other side of the door, and see, I was not kidding. This is an entire field trip worth of orphan brains we're talking about, and it's not even the only one. Sundowner gives us a speech on why baby brain stealing is actually badass. Sundowner's speech is so much more bearable than Monsoon's because everything he says is dripping with big head energy that you can't help but love it. He introduces himself as an honest warmonger. How can you not love this guy? And of course, he has his own sound bites free for the use. Demand for PMCs is about to skyrocket. Like the good old days after 9-11. After Ryan remembers which 9-11 he's talking about, we get to the most pointless gameplay section as we just run forward like two steps and get to the boss. Sundowner talked to big game all game, and it's finally time to put his money where his mouth is. He also has one of Rising's classic, is this a really cool line or a really dumb one? Like I said, kids are cool, Jackie. And I'm very in touch with my inner child. However, before the boss starts proper, you have to get through his array of shields. This is the boss's first lesson. You're gonna have to get really good at precision cutting really quickly. Up until this point, you've had it easy, but if you aren't razor precise, you're gonna blow up. This section is super tense. You have to cut with surgical accuracy to avoid damage. And once you break through, oh my god, the drop is so good. <laughs> Red Sun might be the best song in the game, but that's a title that fluctuates with the wind, so I can't say for certain. The lyrics are really interesting in how, instead of being sung from the boss's perspective, they're sung from the perspective of one of Sundowner's victims. He's a merciless killing machine who rips everything apart! This segment is just as dangerous as the last one, since he busts out his pincer attack, which is not just unparryable, but has stupid long range! The only problem with this segment is that as soon as it really gets going, it's over. 
Except Sundowner ain't going down that easy and use the helicopter to blast ya! So now we gotta use a bird to fly back up and give him the shave he so desperately needs. So it turns out that based on lucid guessing, Raiden decides he needs to head to Pakistan to stop the president from, I don't even know at this point, being eaten by cyber ants. So Doctor comes to pick us up and give us a ride to the rocket so that we can travel to Pakistan in like, two seconds. However, we slip on a bar of soap and fall all the way back down to mission three. Here we run through the entirety of the Denver level, but in reverse. Any more time spent talking about it would be more time than they spent designing the level. So Ryan finds just about the goofiest vehicle he possibly could and is on his way to the lab. Of course, it couldn't be that easy as the final wind of destruction is in our way. Sam and Raiden go to the side of the road and square up for the game's coolest fight. In a game where suplexing Gundams is a core feature, it doesn't get cooler than two guys in the middle of butt f nowhere having a sword fight. The game knows how much of an important moment this is, as it lets you slowly walk forward to meet Sam and the scripted tumbleweed. This thing happens every time the fight starts and I love that it's there. This is about as fair a fight the game can give you. Sam has all the same abilities you do. No minions, no speeches, no shields, it's you and Sam. For your part, you better take off any sub weapons you have and de-equip your healing paste. You're going one-on-one, -on -one, mano a mano, no tricks. The best part comes in his song, the only thing I know for real. It's easily in the top three songs in the game, but what pushes it over the edge is the fact that every boss in the game has the lyrics kick in when they start taking you seriously. It happens with all of them. In your first fight with Sam, the lyrics never play because he isn't taking you seriously. In this fight, it starts with the lyrics because now you're worthy of them. However, when you eventually knock the sword out of his hands, the lyrics stop. If he was treating you as a real threat, he'd go and pick it back up, but he's fine with just judo flipping you into oblivion. When he does get the sword back though, he takes the fight to a whole new level. The fight doesn't even end with you getting to cut Sam into pieces. A simple stab is all it takes and he's down. One last extremely Brazilian wink later, and Sam is gone. And then Raiden realizes he isn't a cyborg. Sam has been ten times you the entire game, and now, after he's gone, you realize that his arm is the only cybernetic part of his body. This man has been using pure human spirit to style on robots this entire time. Wolf wonders if this needed to happen, and Raiden doesn't exactly have an answer. We take a sword to remember him by and then run to the launch site, forgetting that uh, we, we took a motorcycle here. Get the butt! When we finally get to the launch site, we encounter you, the viewer. Yes, this is a personal attack. Oh, oh, you got me, John. So come on. All the game's budget that should have been spent on the last few levels was spent on this guy's mouth. You could fit a bowling ball in there. It turns out the person making us our super duper rocket is Sunny, Snake and Otacon's adopted daughter and professional person Raiden saved. We hop aboard and blast off to Pakistan. Here we encounter three completely worthless rooms before it turns out Wolf stubbed his entire body on a table corner when... that thing pops Colorado Senator Stephen Armstrong, whose only appearance before this was as the person in the cutscene that was so inconsequential that I just skipped it. He tells us we're too late to stop him. The story about American soldiers being killed in Pakistan's out and now they're paying for blood. Twitter isn't gonna like this one one bit. Ryan and Armstrong proceed to have a debate about the financial stability and economics behind a war economy while, and I cannot stress this part, they are a cyborg ninja and supervillain senator respectively. So Armstrong hops into his giant grasshopper robot and we start the fight with Metal Gear Excelsis. The boss may be extremely frustrating in how, like Monsoon, you aren't allowed to hit the boss all the time when I would very much like to start playing the game now, please. The sheer spectacle makes up for it. You are a dust bunny to this thing, but you are parrying attacks bigger than most houses and it feels so cool. Running up the legs, slashing the joints, and getting to wail on its head is amazing. The song 2, Collective Consciousness, is another one not sung from the boss's perspective. It's like an anthem to the world Armstrong's trying to build. So once we give it a proper thrashing, we... Go back to 
playing Chicken Little after showing me this. So somehow Armstrong is completely unharmed and he comes out to fight. Right in hand to hand, where he... Oh, you've got to be kidding me. I can't write anything funnier than the game shows you. You've seen it plenty, but it never gets old. Played college ball, you know. That's some cushy Ivy League school. <laughs> <laughs> of Texas. Could have gone pro if I hadn't joined the Navy. I'm not one of those beltway pansies. I could break the president in two with my bare hands. This is the weirdest fucking day of my life. Don't fuck with this, Senator. So we try to cut him up like you would any politician, but via strategic blackface, he manages to put us on the back foot. This may be the best series of cutscenes ever. It is everything Rising is. It's aggressively goofy, slapping you in the face over and over with the dumbest stuff you've ever seen that becomes the best thing you've ever seen. I have a dream. What? 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 <laughs> it has long, overly verbose speeches delivered about why blowing up everything is actually a really cool thing, and it has Armstrong, which more games should try adding, really. <laughs> so... What do you think? Oh, how the hell did you get elected? <laughs> well, I don't write my own speeches. You debate the ethics of Armstrong's version of America, which would devolve into just Mad Max within 43 minutes, while doing the Hogan Warrior test of strength for WrestleMania 6! Armstrong is so genuinely happy when Ryan pretends to go along with him, and then he just turns around, it's just... Oh man, this cutscene. We get back to the gameplay and... Yeah, but we get a chance to throw hands with Armstrong one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> if I do this for another hour, you're history, buckaroo. So after reaching a critical mass of quotable moments, the Metal Gear blows up and Armstrong's gonna deal the finishing blow. However, just before the finishing purple nurple, Blade Wolf returns with Sam's sword and throws it to us. We then get a line that I'm not willing to negotiate with the terrorists that say it's a so dumb it's cool line. It's the rawest line in the game. I'm strong! I said my sword was a tool of justice. Not used in anger. Not used for vengeance. But now, now I'm not so sure. And besides, this isn't my sword. Your final battle is against the strongest senator in the world, and it's, it's unbelievable. This man punches you with volcanoes, does dash attacks, elbow drops you, leads Colorado, he does it all! He does super kicks and slaps his leg like it's pro wrestling! How does this man exist? The boss is not here to make you learn. This is the final exam and you'd better ace everything from dodges to parries to precise slashes. His boss theme, it has to be this way, is so good! The lyrics, though, aren't about Armstrong. This is Raiden's theme. This is all about the journey we've been on over the past, and I cannot stress this enough, 24 hours! When you finally get Armstrong's 200% health down to its last bit, you need to parry his hits before ripping out his super heart. His final words confirm that Raiden's taken his words to heart. And speaking of heart... So the news report that Colorado Senator Armstrong got exploded in Pakistan by a cyber ninja for some reason, and Doctor lets us know that the baby brains are in good hands. His hands. Those aren't good hands. The game ends with Raiden leaving to go fight his own war for a change, which directly leads into Metal Gear Rising 2, which directly leads me to the bottom of this bottle. God damn you to hell, Konami! <laughs> So, the game's over, and there are things I don't like. Most of Denver, of course, is terrible, and the level isn't that great either. 
The combat is far from the deepest hack and slash, it's pretty short and doesn't feature a lot of enemy variety, but I can't hear you over the sound of how many robots I can throw in this game! Substance should usually take precedent over style in a game, but when a game like this or Mad World or every other Platinum and Clover game ever made, it's impossible to ignore. And the core of Rising's combat is such a blast that it has enough substance to make the style feel even better! It's silly, it's over the top, it's brutal, it's Metal Gear, and I I love Metal Gear. F Konami.